Hello, Biohacker Nation. Here we are once again. This is Dr. Mike along with... Come That's on. where I point to you. Go ahead. Give me that little intro. Come oh, come on. You can't introduce yourself for Give once? me a little mad scientist All action. right. The mad scientist himself, Jim. <laughs> What's up, Biohacker Nation? <laughs> So, we got a couple things to talk about. Mostly it's going to be a lot of foot talk, maybe a little CrossFit talk, but first, the important things from the med scientist. Go ahead. People, see a competent doctor. We're not here to diagnose, <laughs> treat, or cure any disease, illness, or ailment. So, if there's an emergency, call 911. Otherwise, go see your competent doctor. This is for purely educational purposes only, this show. Enjoy it. Love it. Tell a friend to subscribe to it. We're also 51C3 nonprofit. You can donate as a patron to these podcasts. We can upgrade studios. We can upgrade the research, get you better stuff, and we are more than happy to give you some biohacker gear as a thanks, have you on our show, even make you a weekly guest if you'd like. Whatever it takes for you to keep on coming back, because we are greatly appreciative of all you biohacker nation ers ets. No. We'll make our own conjugates of that. Yeah. You know, the chive is the chivettes. <laughs> I've never heard of a chiver. So we could have Bionac Hacker Nationettes or Biohacker Nationers. Do we really have to split the difference? You want to? I don't want to be called an et. <laughs> well, we're going with the Biohackers, but okay. <laughs> Whichever <laughs> preference you want. So, a little word from a sponsor here we've got Functionized Integrative Therapeutics in Colts Neck, New Jersey. These guys are. Awesome. They're not just your regular doctor's office if you would. You go, you sit, you twiddle your thumbs, you never get seen. When you finally get in, you maybe see the doctor for 20 seconds. He throws a script at you, smacks you on your butt with a little invoice, and says, see you later. Now, these guys, they go to the cellular level, all the way deep down to your genetic makeup, find out how you're made up, how the best way to treat you is, what are the best supplements for your specific DNA? Everything from improving cognitive function through bio and neurofeedback, concussion, baseline testing, and treatments, should God forbid you bonk that noggin of yours. Yeah, they increase your telomere length, really, literally show you that you're aging less. Uh, anything from was that the Genetoscalt, which is mm -hmm. awesome, where they can end up having guarantees for weight loss and uh, losing a few inches. It's they really know their stuff. And these guys will definitely get you functionized in every single way. So you don't have to necessarily be in pain or discomfort to see these guys, which they are phenomenal at, by the way. They will get that pain reduced and hopefully eliminated in a very fast and efficient time period. But after that, that's where the fun really begins. Increase longevity, increase vitality, and just be a better you. Get functionized with funct functionized integrative therapeutics. Colts Neck, New Jersey, check out their Instagram, check out their website, functionized.com. That is www.functionized.com. All right, Dr. Mike, let's All get right. into some other fun here. Sure. So this week, we pretty much, uh, well, we've both been accused of having a few hippie tendencies every now and then, as if you look down, you can't see it, but if we look down at our feet, there are, well... Uh, no, very limited footwear. <laughs> um, and it's you know, commonplace with us. We like to brag about how it's good and everything. And what's nice is there's actually a lot of research to prove this. Um, anything Research, you say? Yes, we actually use that. Good research. You know, uh, Not like the uh, carb cycling stuff that we uh, discussed there, there last week. There was plenty week, of right? guys on forums that had their own opinions. And, and yeah, big so bellies. Yeah, that. got it. Yep. So, yeah, how, how's that been going, by the way? Are you on a, still on your carb cycle? No. <laughs> <laughs> no I, one month experiment going on that one? The one month experiment was terminated just due to the fact that, <laughs> man, my body was just like revolting. It didn't like it. Um, well, I thought you had a few days you felt great, you know, when you dropped all the carbs. Yeah, when no, I dropped all the carbs, I started feeling good. that keto phase. I don't know if so the stress or the reaction to. To some of the carbs I was eating, but those hives that were breaking out all over the place, the lethargy, the Fantastic irritability, <laughs> yeah, the workouts that I should not have even gotten up in the morning for. Um, yeah, yeah, so keto all the way. <laughs> yep, I'm not back on keto after I had my little, we won't call it a carb cycle, more of a carb binge to put back the weight. I didn't at all need to do it to put on the weight, it was just delicious, and I was done after about two days. <laughs> I, I missed not feeling like crap. <laughs> it sounds like you more than understood that one. 
and then so yeah so uh feet you know uh, we all have two of them we for the most part i don't think most they're part, very replaceable so it's good to keep you know good health for them and every people spend a lot of money on shoes crap ton crap ton you had to find a way to get that in there. It was there. <laughs> Just had to go for it. <laughs> I mean, people, their focus on shoes can be anything from aesthetics. You know, you got to spend two hundred dollars to have you know, that one red strip down the side, get or them kicks, a specific yo. Nike symbol, or whatnot going down. And you know, it is what it is. You like your shoes, you like your shoes. But when it comes down to what's best for your feet, it's best to well, not like them as much. I am. When people think about a shoe, even though you know people sell for having that thick cushion, oh, nice thick sole, it's good for you, nice and fluffy, and good support, get that arch support up in there. Yeah, because you know we were Cushiony. all because we were all born, you know, evolved to you know with shoes, right? I mean, we were meant to have this big. I cushion came out of my there. mom with shoes on. My feet were the tread of a tire. It was, it was awesome. Okay. I'm just imagining you right now with high heels as a kid. So I didn't say high really heels, I said tires. This is my image. Leave me alone. But anyway, so <laughs> with barefoot, first of all, with shoes, you're walking on a hard surface. We walk on hard surfaces all day. A lot of people don't even don't even touch the ground, like the actual ground in a given day. You go from the hardwood floors or from your house out to the driveway, to the pavement, into the car, back on the sidewalk, and even with shoes, you never actually hit the dirt. And then even if you do, who cares? Your shoe is still a flat, hard surface. So you don't get to use all these little small intrinsic muscles of the foot, where if you look out on the ground, there is really no flat ground. If you call it flat, put your hand or foot on it. It's not flat. As you move, there's the little, we'll call it weeble wobble, where you have to use your feet. The proprioception gets there, so you can actually get body awareness, which you don't get with shoes. And you know, I think the best example of that, if you look at the beach, I mean, the beach... So you're by the boardwalk. By the beach area, it's all the footprints everywhere. And even if it, there's no footprints and it's in the off-season, the wind blows the sand. It's not totally flat. you got little divots and grooves. And they say, hey, let's go down by the ocean. The ocean, it's very flat, right? It just pounds us into the sand. The erosion happens, washes away. It's flat. It's still at an angle. So, yeah, no matter where you go, it's not totally flat. Even if you take that sand analogy into example you take it into a park you take it into your yard now the difference is it's much better soil so there's now vegetation growing on it but that's really what it looks like underneath just throwing that out there yeah, for people who are saying yeah it's totally flat and straight it's like a steamer yeah. went over it so no, there's a different give to it even when you have that flat hard sand it's a much different give than you know hardwood floors oh and then some and course. i mean that will start putting the pressure on the arch and then we get to all kinds of things you know flat feet shin splints uh you know <laughs> what do people do to usually treat those they give them specialized shoes or orthotics which again then limits the amount of motion and the strength that you can get in the foot yeah, and then i remember going through school and getting certified in orthotics <laughs> yep i was sold i thought they were the greatest things in the world I'll put another hard piece of plastic in there yeah it's perfect your foot has perfect motion it doesn't move at all <laughs> <laughs> so that's a nice arc while you're wearing it it does and sometimes it's comfortable and so eventually i don't know about you but i actually took them out threw them away took the Orthotic that comes in the sneakers. People don't realize that orthotics actually come in every pair of sneakers. Yeah, that, under the that very, very like millimeter inch of rubber or polyurethane or whatever it is that uh, the different manufacturer makes. That's what they call the sole support. Yeah. <laughs> it comes right out. Rip it on out. <laughs> makes it even harder. But by making it harder, you're actually now challenging and working those intrinsic muscles of the feet that should work. And just to get a little bit more shoeist for a couple of seconds of this thick uh, you know, padding, thick sole that everyone you know, pays an extra $80 for to get this extra inch padding. 80 Oh, for the inch yeah, padding, we're talking about the uh, $400 <laughs> orthotics that you make. And it's still all over the place. It's I'm making some noise over there, Jim. I put this chair together. Oh, Darn just... straight, it creaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine's nice and fine. I'm glad. I did not put that one together, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, so with... Small little talk on gait. So, in general, when we walk, we do a heel strike, so we land on the heel first, usually go to the outside or lateral aspect of the foot, come up on the balls of the toes. It's the way we're supposed to walk. Okay, when we run, 
This was something I was taught differently through schools. That was the same pattern we're supposed to have when we run. All the research shows, yes, that's what commonly we do when you wear shoes. But what happens if you compare to all the people who don't wear shoes, any from our aboriginals or to, you know, super neo hippies? It's much <laughs> different. Um, people who wow. are used to being barefooted or non-shoed, uh, they tend to run on the forefront of their foot. So it's much more on the top of the foot. And it's interesting how much better this is for the foot. Uh, one of the big examples is there's seven times less the amount of pressure that comes down into pretty much all the joints of your low extremity from running on the forefoot. And having that thick sole of the shoe actually promotes landing on the heel. And when you land on the heel, it gets a huge impact to the heel, to the knees. Uh, and each step, you know, adds up about, somehow they did the research, about 70 body weights is the official measurement, as opposed to when you're on the forefront of your foot, it's 30 body weights. So it really comes down to when you're running on the forefront of your foot, all the shock then is going into what is built for it, your calves. And your foot actually takes the absorption and it pushes back to propel you forward, and so just jamming it more into your knees, ankles, and flattening the arc, and you're causing, most likely causing things with shin splints, early arthritis of the knee, and you look like you want to say something. I wish there was a way I could actually show everybody. We're going to have to do some live shows here soon enough. But to show when they heel strike, yeah. what it actually looks like. I mean, when you've got those huge cushy, you know, I'm not picking on any sneaker manufacturers at all, but say... You pick on all of them. All right, so say we, there's this huge air pocket in the back that just feels so <laughs> cool to bounce up and down. It's almost like this little cushy trampoline. And you're more inclined to want to actually hit that. It feels nice. It feels good. It's there. The way that the shoe is designed and built, it's for you to land and hit that rear aspect of the shoe. So it does what it's meant to do. Exactly. And the fact that your ankle now is rigid, your knee is straight, your hip is straight, all that force is now transmitted and jammed right back up through every single joint, all the way through the hip and the lower back, and people don't understand why they're getting knee pain, hip pain, back pain. Even goes up into the wrap system of neck or shoulder pain. But is it pain just part of life when you get older, Jim? Unfortunately, Dr. Mike, no. <laughs> no people say, yeah, it hurt. I'm older. You, you just get aches and pains. You're not supposed to. I mean, yeah, it tends to happen with age, but it doesn't mean that you should accept that you're not... There's no reason that saying as you age we're supposed to get more pain. We're I, supposed to fall apart. I was always that's told. the whole thing about biohacking is make sure that <laughs> we don't. We want to be functionized all through life. I was always told pain is your brain's way of telling you something's wrong. It's the alert system going off. I like a lot more than pain's weakness leaving your body because I realize how much weakness I have when coaches would tell me that. <laughs> so that always bothered me. Pain is weakness leaving your body here. You're a weak, weak guy. What can yeah. I say? There's uh, some research also shown that I found showing prices of sneakers compared to injuries. And this is in a running population. And it was found that the sneakers with the least amount of injury are those that are $40 and below. Go into your Payless store, getting a flexible but no cushion type sneaker are the ones where individuals have the least amount of injury. This doesn't include the Vibrams, the five-toe ones we're talking about the main manufacturers here. Those that buy shoes that are hundred dollars and above are most likely to be injured. Now I don't know if this is an idea that people who decide to blow their did I say blow their income? I didn't say income yet, but um, uh, use that they spend in a certain way. They spend in a certain way. If their mentality is that to exercise and build up their body or is it just simply they're doing all they can, so therefore they get the sneaker that they feel is best, so therefore let's go get the New Balances properly fitted, pay 200 bucks for them. They're more inclined to be injured. The ones with the music, you put the little iPad, or iPad, that's a big shoe. The iPod, old school, um, in the shoe, very likely to be injured. The more the sneaker is, the more likely the in individual is to be injured. I mean, there's just more features that are put into a shoe that really we don't need. Again, we were made to not have shoes. The only features that we really need is to have the foot to move. 
And shoes are notorious for keeping your foot still. Mm -hmm. I mean, even let's say when you're supposed to run, what's one of the first thing people do? They tie the shoes as tight as they can. Right. They restrict the foot, uh, not just, you know, it doesn't slide anywhere. It doesn't have that lateral movement where it should be spreading down and kind of expanding into impact. Again, the shoes are made to not do that. And that's kind of what the whole problem is. And the... When I was doing the Tough Mudder a few years ago, it was a 13.2-mile course. I trained with the five-toe Vibrams. Mm. I was starting to understand what we're talking about here, and running cross-country literally all my life, I was a heel striker. Decided to try something new, and immediately when I put on those five-finger-toe shoes, if you would... Five-finger-toe? Okay. Well. All of a sudden, inadvertently, I'm four-foot striking. Huge, huge difference, because if you, there's no way to actually heel strike. you got to try to heel strike, because there is no heel on there. Yeah, I mean, that thick cushion pretty much works as an anchor to, well, drop your heel first. Absolutely. And now it's, you actually use the mechanics of your foot properly. It's amazing. It is. Proper foot mechanics lead to proper biomotor function, and with this function, increased function, you're far, far, far less inclined to be injured, and less injury leads to greater times to be able to train, greater times to be able to train, leads to better success. I mean, people kind of ignore the whole foot hygiene part, but I mean, it is literally the base that we stand on. So you change the mechanics of your foot, changes the knee, the hip, the back. And as you mentioned, it's where we get all the pain that we're not supposed to get as we get older. But the good thing is that there does appear to be a few ways where you can uh, prevent and reverse it. I know, and we're going to publish this on our post show notes and on the website of biohackhumans.com as well. So why don't we just give a little overview of this and then everybody can actually look at the cool photos and video. Sure, I'm guessing by this, you're talking about the case study from the summer. I am. That was a fun case study. That was fun. Random, so, but fun. What made it fun was really the fact that it worked. But I mean, it always makes things more fun. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this if it didn't work, would we? Well, no, we talked about carb cycling. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, anyway. Touche, so, sir. With... Initially, it started off as I have one highly pronated foot. It kind of really goes off to the side. Happened, I suspect, because I've sprained it five times. And going through school, there was a professor I respect a lot, Dr. Ross Ebbets. Uh, he went ahead and he had these foot drills that he used with a lot of different athletic teams, even up to, I believe it was, um, world track teams. Mm -hmm. And so, He was the running guy. Yep, the running guy. He hated that's what he was known for. He told me directly. He hated that he was known as the That's what he did. That's guy. just what but he did what all he the did. time. So what are you be known for? <laughs> it's always good to be known for something, but I guess it's best to be known for everything. It's what if I eat Twinkies every day. Oh, jeez. Like, for every meal. And I'm going to class or going to work, and all people see me with Twinkies. They're going to call me the Twinkie guy, won't they? they just start calling me Twinkie. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Okay, off of Twinkies. Uh, so these foot drills. Again, there's going to be a lot more details about it on uh, well, on the website for sure. And we'll have links on it probably on Instagram. But what it was, was it took about five minutes a day. I just took his advice. And there's these six foot drills where you pretty much walk outside barefoot. And I even did it on hills because why not? Just had a little bit more muscle tension to go. But you walk on your toes, your heels, the inside, outside of your foot. And then you go pigeon-toed with your feet in and then out. You only do this for about 80 feet, and we had a few outcome measures to kind of make sure that it made a difference, and all three of the outcome measures had a significant difference change. It was pretty cool. Uh, one was just the angle of how my feet uh, turned out and then coming back in being less pronated. It was substantial. Uh, we also had weight pressure differentials, where at first, with the way my feet were, I had all carried all the weight, go figure, on the heels of my foot. Hmm. Yeah, shocker. And then afterwards, it was redistributed to where there really wasn't any significant pressure on any part of the foot. Almost it was balanced out. Kind of nice. And then the last one was we had this navicular drop test where it's one of the bones in your foot just kind of measured the difference when you sit down. When you stand up, this bone drops a little bit from you know, the pressure of you know, gravity in your body and weight. Bones tend to move when you move. They should move. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get, I'm sure we'll talk about it sometime. But um, if they move so much, it's defined as a flat foot. And after just doing a month of these drills, both my feet went from considered flat foot to non-flat. And like I said, it only takes five minutes a day, walk outside, you get a little bit of extra benefit from walking barefoot anyways. We talked a little bit. Uh, I believe it was our uh, 
debut episode about earthing, mm-hmm. which more research is coming about that, which is really cool. But um, no, it's just good to know this stuff works. It helps decrease the risks of ankle sprains, shin splints, and honestly, if you haven't walked outside barefoot, it just feels good. I mean, everyone knows going to the beach and walking around barefoot sounds great. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to, you know, worry about getting a major parasite or some crazy disease from your foot walking outside, because I've heard that many times. And that still blows my mind. Where the heck are you walking? I mean, you're not walking like a manure <laughs> field. We are meant to walk barefoot outside. There, there's not much that can go on. And, you know, it helps strengthen your foot, let alone callus the bottom of your skin, and help prevent other things from happening anyway, such as um, people who walk outside more have that thicker skin. You're less likely to get athletics. Athletic foot and um, yeah, parasites. Like that one. Yeah. So feel free to walk through a uh, manure field at that point, I guess, right? I mean, if you want to run that case study, feel, feel yeah. free. <laughs> Have at it. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know that works. <laughs> so I'm mostly done on foot feet. Foot feet at this point. I'm pretty sure we can get quite a few direct messages on that, so it'll be fun. <laughs> So, I had another topic I want to bring up today, just because we're in the midst of one of the most exciting times of the CrossFit season. Um, the idea of fittest on earth is... You a, smiled when you said I that. I do, because <laughs> it's a pretty sweet term. And when you go back and look at all the Sports Illustrated, they ask, who's the greatest athlete of all time? You hear Muhammad Ali thrown in there, you'll hear Michael Jordan thrown in there. Every once in a while, a baseball player will be thrown in there, um, which, though baseball has been my sport since I was literally three, I got to say that baseball players are not necessarily what you'd think of the greatest athletes of all time. <laughs> Those with some of the greatest hand-eye coordination, yes, absolutely, but does that actually transfer to pure athleticism, where you need to run 90 feet, and then you stop for maybe 20 minutes? Right, next year, oh, I'm not going to go on. You know, the prime athletes of professional bowling as well. I always love watching that on TV. Exactly. I mean, little one day like be in such great prime shape. <laughs> the idea, though, of CrossFit is more fascinating to me because that is true fitness. And it's tries it integrates to, everything it does. with performance speed, power, coordination, especially when you start getting tired. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when it comes down to it, are CrossFit athletes going to be the best basketball players, football players, baseball players, golfers, bowlers? I mean, whatever it is, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's all functional training, which is where it comes down to. It helps with everybody. Exactly. I mean, uh, I mean CrossFit athletes are, you're right, prime functional trainers. If you, I firmly believe that. When you play a sport, it should be sport-specific. But it's very difficult to be sport-specific laying on a bench. When in the world, other than when you're on the bottom of a pile in a football game where guys are eye-gouging each other and trying to knock your teeth out, do you need to push somebody straight up and over? But it's not a barbell. It's a fat, sweaty body that you're just trying to get out of your way. No, I mean, when you go to football, for instance, say a lineman. It's far better to take a hammer strength where you're standing. You've got no backing to it because out on the field, there's no backing to it. That's a lot more specific. When you come to CrossFit, you just become a physical specimen. Your endurance is increased. Your strength is increased. I have never been so strong in my entire life. I had so much endurance in my entire life since I started participating in the sport of CrossFit. And... Once I started participating in the sport of CrossFit and then seeing some of the times that some of these top athletes actually accomplish, absolutely freaking blows my mind. And watching them do it and go side by side with them trying to do it, yeah, it's you, insane. You've had a few uh, much more colorful language than that before. But yeah, the stuff that they can do in the times, it's ridiculous. It is. Now, can CrossFit, as the founder, Greg Glassman, said uh, a month or two ago when the CrossFit Open started, can CrossFit cure diabetes? (laughs) He said yes. I know. Uh, uh, Okay. Well, yes and no. Interesting question. Yes and no. CrossFit has been able to take individuals off of a couch who think that you need to go to a gym for hours on end every day 
doing bodybuilding movements, to which they don't understand, which most people in the gym don't understand, but I will digress quickly, and gets them off their butt and with a group of people pursuing the same thing. I've seen grandmothers who are 50, 60 pounds overweight, have arms hanging off them bigger than my kids. And they're in there. They're rowing. They're jumping. They're moving. And they lose all this weight. So in the case like that, yeah. Yeah, you can reverse signs and symptoms of certain pathologies that are brought on by chronic obesity. I mean, exercise works. I mean, we're meant to move. And we had something like CrossFit where it's not just one movement. I mean, for any of you guys who haven't seen what a lot of CrossFit workouts are out there, everything is full body, and they're typically short. So there's people who don't want to, you know, don't want to spend an hour and a half, two hours in the gym. You don't have to to get results. I mean, those are the standard bodybuilding techniques. Again, that's not functional. I don't really, I mean, as impressive as bodybuilding is, I don't really think that helps with athleticism much at all. CrossFit really does. It does. Um, when I was playing baseball, all I really knew was bodybuilding movements and techniques. Mm -hmm. Because, well, that's really what was out there. It's a standard. It's what you're trained for any sport. you got to know how to bench, got to squat, deadlift. What else is there? Then when I got to college, I started working with a phenomenal strength and conditioning coach. He started showing me some different ways. But again, it wasn't as pure athleticism specific. He showed me functional training. Really opened up my eyes to that. Where CrossFit is the slang term, it's not a slang term, but it's the uh, it's brand trademark one, brand, yeah. thank you, for HIT, mm -hmm. High Intensity Interval Training. Most people don't understand how HIT is truly done, but CrossFit, they are a good hybrid of it. But with CrossFit, I mean, you do get the HIT training, there's Olympic lifting thrown in there, plyometrics, powerlifting, gymnastics, calisthenics, elements of strongman, um, swimming, Middle distance runs, I mean, you take all this and throw it together, and you're going to be a overall better athlete. Yeah, it hits every part of athleticism at some point. And when it comes down to it, when you're playing an actual sport, whoever's in the best shape ends up winning. So you take the type of shape you were in for CrossFit, and now you start applying skill to it. Think about if you are in this type of shape and you're a basketball player, for instance. Now you get your skill down of free throws and hitting your jump shots knowing how to pick and roll, knowing how to keep it tight, and all of a sudden, come fourth quarter, the other team's gas, and you're just starting out. Yeah, a good warm-up for the first hour. Exactly, and that's really what it comes down to. Now, there's a lot of people that will criticize the sport, saying it's not a sport, you're just working out. I challenge any of you who think golf is a sport, fishing is a sport, don't forget NASCAR. I was coming up on Fair NASCAR next. Left turn. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what really is a sport other than competition? If you really want to break it down, we can say thumb wrestling is a sport. <laughs> I know people are trying to say that uh, food eating is not a sport, but it's still a competition. <laughs> so, well, I mean, if you want to define a sport by competition, then, yeah, it's a sport. And if anyone has truly, truly pushed themselves to achieve certain times and benchmarks... In CrossFit, well, you're going to know that there's a power greater than you at some point. <laughs> because <laughs> you're going to be begging for, for mercy yeah. and wondering, why am I doing this? Every single workout, why am I doing this, you say to yourself. And then you lie on the floor, look up at the ceiling. Eventually, you start to see straight again. You smile and say, I'm alive. Oh. Damn, I can't wait <laughs> to do this again. <laughs> Sometimes you do another one that day, if you're really that hardcore, but otherwise you look forward to the next day. I mean, the biggest criticism I always heard about CrossFit is how everybody gets injured, which, I mean, it is very common. But the big thing with that, at least from what I've seen, my experience with it, is that's when people stop worrying about their form. I mean, any type of exercise form does tend to go out when you get fatigued or when you're trying to go for as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's all part of the training is to make sure that you have proper form. And name so one sport where injured, you don't get hurt, right? Name exactly. any sport. You overtrain in anything, you will get hurt. And it's really just a way for someone to, I don't know, develop haters, I guess we can call <laughs> it. <laughs> it's <laughs> I know the certifying body, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, had a little, uh, we'll call it a little riff with CrossFit. When they, <laughs> and I am certified by the NSCA and very grateful to the NSCA, 
since 2003 to be a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Greatly appreciated, but, but. Um, you know, one of their studies showed that, no, it ended up in a lawsuit actually, but there was, uh, they questioned the risk-benefit ratio for such an extreme type of program such as CrossFit. It comes down to buyer beware, who, if you want to go and climb Mount Everest, you know, you should know there's some risks associated with it. <laughs> if you want to step into a boxing ring or an octagon, you know there's risks. There's risks playing soccer. There's more concussions in soccer than yeah, any mean, other sport. If the football. anyone who's played a sport for more than, I was going to say five years, but realistically two or three years, mm -hmm. you're going to have some injury in that sport if you're trying. Right. Like it just happens. When you put your body to the extreme, you're trying to do your best. Yeah, your body rebels once in a while. That's fine. You heal, you get back to it, and mm -hmm. again. Proper stretching, foam rolling, um, having the right treatment done, such as those guys that uh, functionized, um, doing your corrective exercise, going through your motion patterns. These things will help prevent injury. Making sure your heart rate variability is monitored helps know what days to train harder and what days to train with less intensity, or other days train with more intensity, and that means weight, volume, repetitions. Mm -hmm. So if you want to keep busting it day in and day out and day in and day out, doing three wads a day, for those who are unsure of we'll what, workout of the day, which is anywhere from a, say, five-minute to 20-minute, just absolute go crazy to the wall. Yeah. For those who think you can't get a good workout in 10 minutes, well, talk to us. We have a few ideas <laughs> for you. Oh, geez. With that being said, there's proper ways of doing everything. Yeah. Those that get injured, such as myself, I'll say it, but I still enjoy the sport. Well, it's going to happen. And I, I was training very hard. And it happened. I pushed through it. Didn't care. Tore a rotator cuff and still kept on throwing 315 pounds push presses over my head. Smart? No. <laughs> but at least oh, I admit yeah. that. <laughs> so don't hate the game. Find something you love. Find something you enjoy. Pursue it. It doesn't have to be CrossFit. It can be any other sport, any other activity that you truly like doing. Just be physically f active, physically fit. Disease risks will go greatly down. Yeah, Life work, will go up. Enjoyability. So find something that you enjoy to help you move. Exactly. Right now, the CrossFit Regionals are wrapping up, and uh, August will be the games this year, so tune in. I think it's a definite emerging sport. They've done everything the right way, and it's a lot of fun to watch these athletes and what they can do, and actually participating in it, you have a whole new appreciation of what they're doing day in and day out. They say Some people say it's like a sacrifice, but to, if you talk to some of these athletes, it's not a sacrifice. They just purely love doing it every day. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I was nodding. I got nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, if you have a smart device or a laptop, a desktop. Or, or a friend that has one. Yeah, you know, exactly. Find your resources. If you like what we have to say, give us an honest five-star review. Really? That's it. I mean, <laughs> really, just do it. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Again, it just helps us get stuff out. And again, feel free to yeah, get any comments. Especially if they're positive, or anything that you want us to hear or talk about, or you know anything that we say. I mean, I don't know. You're probably down for this, but challenge us. I mean, if there's something that you heard differently, let us know and make us go ahead and learn a little bit more. And we will gladly uh, let you know if you are, well, especially if you're wrong. We'll let you know what we think <laughs> about what we find. Challenge accepted. So again, if anyone finds any of those good carb cycling research that we've seen <laughs> everyone talk about on forums but haven't been able to find. Please let us know. I really do want to read them. Absolutely. And keep the comments coming on Instagram, the direct messages. We're definitely enjoying them, especially the ones that are not dirty. <laughs> <laughs> it's very flattering what some of you individuals have to say about us and, uh, and Shantae there. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. we got some workouts that we've been posting from time to time up there, so if you're looking to challenge yourself in new ways, go ahead. Just remember that these workouts are not for you, specifically. They may be fun to do. Go for it, enjoy them, but really get with your healthcare professional and make sure that you're following a proper program that's designed specifically for you. Interview different trainers at your local gyms and or strength conditioning coaches in your area 
and figure out who is the best fit for you and who will help you get your, to your goals. And we have new content and up routinely, so if you haven't checked recently, go on and check it out. Exactly. There's probably something new up there. Exactly. So, maybe we'll do this again next week, have another podcast? I think that's a good plan. Why don't we just uh, keep that rolling? And... Yeah, why not? i got nothing else to do that day. <laughs> All right. So, Biohacker Nation, as always, thank you for listening, and we will talk at you again soon. We out. Thank you.